One day. All I ask for is one day where I don't make a video and a whole bunch of new content comes out within hours of the last one. So this will be my third video for today. There's a new Unearthed Arcana for 2020 called Subclasses Part 1. If you want to see what's in it as I read through it for the first time with you, stay tuned. Four new subclasses. Let us go through. We have, first up, Barbarian, Path of the Beast. So this is one who, similar in some cases, I'd say to like a totem warrior who venerates a totem spirit, you sort of become more bestial rather than kind of, you know, honoring them and gaining powers from them. You sort of embrace the inner beast and it manifests in a physical way. So there's the origin of the beast table here. One of your parents is a lycanthrope, and you inherited some of the curse. You're descended from a legendary druid. A fey, gift, a fey spirit gifted you this, or an ancient animal spirit dwells within you. So at three, you get form of the beast. When you enter a rage, you can transform, revealing your bestial powers. You don't have to, mind you, if you have a cool weapon, but you probably are going to want to go with this. Until your rage ends, you manifest a natural weapon, choosing one of the following options each time you rage, which is nice, because you get to change it, and each one has uses. So you can get a bite. Your bite deals 1d8 piercing damage on a hit, and once on each of your turns when you damage a creature with your bite, you regain a number of hit points equal to your constitution modifier minimum of 1. Remind you, this will synergize well with the level 20 ability when you get an extra boost to your constitution, and it doesn't require any action economy to do so. And it's just part of your rage. You enter the rage, this happens, then you can choose to gain the hit points if you want. Claws. Your hands transform into claws, dealing a d6 damage, so you're a little bit less. But when you take the attack action on your turn and make an attack with your claws, you can make one additional attack using your claws as part of the same action. So let's reread that and make sure we understand it correctly. When you take the attack action on your turn, so you remember making an attack, and you make an attack with your claws you can make one additional attack using your claws as part of the same action. So I can't understand if that means you, at level 5, you make four attacks, or at level 5, you make three attacks. So I'm, Oh, it's just the attack action. My mistake, not a singular attack. So normally, as a barbarian, you take the attack action and make two attacks. This is allowing you to make a third attack. Mind you, this is not using your bonus action. This is still as part of that singular action, Again, another reason why a lot of people have issues with the Berserker Barbarian. It's a bonus action attack that causes exhaustion. This claw thing here is going to give you an extra attack for free. Um, or a tail attack, which does a d12 piercing damage, which is pretty sweet. And it has reach, meaning you can hit people 10 feet away with your tail that does a d12. And there's nothing saying you can't still have a weapon. So if they're further away, you can smack them with your tail. If they get in close, you can hit them with a greatsword. Whatever you want, it works on all the different levels. At 6th level, you get Bestial Soul. So all of those natural weapons we just discussed, the Bite, Claw, and Tail, become magic for the purposes of overcoming damage resistance, which is great because if you don't have access to one, you can choose to forego using a weapon entirely and transform using one of your three abilities, and that's considered magic. And you get something else. When you finish a short or long rest, choose one of the following benefits which lasts until you finish your next short or long rest. You gain a swimming speed equal to your walking speed and can breathe underwater. Remember, that's going to be boosted by your unarmored movement ability as a barbarian. You gain a climbing speed equal to your walking speed, same thing. And you can climb difficult surfaces, including upside down on ceilings, without needing to make an ability check. Or when you jump, you make a strength athletics check and extend your jump by a number of feet equal to the check's total. Did you, did you, did we get that? The check's total. You can make this special check only once per turn. So you're going to make an athletics check, roll a d20, and add that total number to the jump's distance. So normally it's like, I think the long jump distance is like, I forget what it is, a couple of times your, your strength modifier or something like that. But if you roll a natural 20 and let's say your athletics score is an 8, you just added 28 feet to your jump, which is crazy. It also doesn't state whether it's a long jump 
or vertical jump. So that could be a straight vertical jump going an extra 28 feet. But they did put this rule tip, so thank you for this. Jumping costs movement. When you jump, every foot you clear on the jump costs a foot of your movement on the current turn. When a class feature, a spell, or another object effect extends your jump, the bonus fees, uh, movement fee, movement feet also costs movement. So basically what it's saying is it does not allow you to jump past the number of feet you can move on a turn. So if you can move 40 feet in a turn, you can only move 40 feet via jumping. If you have a jump distance that's 60 feet, you're going to jump 40 feet this turn, and unless you dash or something else, the rest of your jump isn't going to happen until the next turn. At 10, Infectious Fury. When you hit a creature with one of those natural weapons that we already get for free as part of a rage that are now considered magic for overcoming damage resistance, you can choose uh, to... You can curse a target with a Rabid Fury. The target must make a wisdom saving throw equal to 8 plus your constitution modifier plus your proficiency bonus or suffer one of the following effects you get to choose. Um, the target uses its reaction to make a melee attack against another creature of your choice. You get to pick the creature that you can see or it just takes 2d12 psychic damage. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your con mod and get them back when you finish a long rest. So not super uh, abusable because it's a limited time per long rest. But it's tied to Constitution, which is a stat you will usually have a lot of points in, and it synergizes well with all of the previous abilities. And lastly, Call the Hunt. When you enter a rage, you can choose a number of willing creatures you can see within 30 feet of you equal to your Constitution modifier. Until your rage ends, the chosen features gain the Reckless Attack feature and have advantage on saving throws against Frightened. So they gain the ability to choose to take Reckless Attack. That's amazing! Uh, you also gain five temporary hit points for each creature that accepts the benefit. So chances are, like I said, it's typically going to be around the three to five, but if you manage to max out your, your con, it may get even higher at level 20. But let's say you do have a 20 constitution, and you have five allies that all accept this ability, you're going to get 25 temporary hit points because of that. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your constitution modifier per long rest, and let's go ahead and throw it out there. And remember, Reckless Attack is not an action or a bonus action to activate. You just say you want to use Reckless Attack, and then you use it. Let's say you give Reckless Attack to your fighter ally. Your fighter ally who uses strength to make attacks could use Action Surge, and all of those attacks would have advantage. Your Paladin ally could use that and then also get the benefit of attacks, you know, of advantage, hopefully getting a crit, maybe turning a smite into ridiculous amounts of damage. A very, very useful ability. I like this a lot. Uh, plus, you get temporary hit points in the process. And again, there's also the advantage on saving throws against being frightened, so it works really well. Let's move on to the Way of Mercy Monk. This is what I like to consider the update to the Way of Tranquility Monk. If you remember, this was an old Unearthed Arcana called the Way of Tranquility Monk, and it's basically, one of its things was it was all about like trying to avoid combat, and they could essentially use Lay on Hands like a Paladin could, except it was twice as good as the Paladins was, as in 10 times per level points of healing, and they could do it as part of a flurry of blows. I know, I played one for 16 levels in the Out of the Abyss campaign that's here on the channel, this looks like a much more balanced version of it, but I will say the Way of Tranquility Monk gave you that really good healing ability at the front and then had pretty much nothing useful to level 17. This fixes that quite a bit. So um, let's see, it says they typically wear robes with deep cowls that often conceal their faces or wear masks, and they give you some options for different masks that you can wear here. If you wear a mask, choose its appearance. Implements of Mercy. You gain proficiency in the Insider Medicine skill and gain proficiency with the Herbalism and Poisoner's kit. That is a... Also, this is one that like a level 3 dip into Monk, if you can swing it, is huge. You get a skill proficiency and then Herbalism and Poisoner's kit. Then you're also going to get Hands of Healing. As an action, you can spend a key point to touch a creature and restore a number of hit points equal to the roll of your Martial Arts die plus your Wisdom modifier. So remember at the beginning, that's going to be a D4 d6 d8 and it will cap out at a d10 uh, but a d10 plus your wisdom modifier if you get high enough when you use your flurry of blows you can replace 
one of the unarmed strike. Remember, Flurry of Blows is a bonus action. You make two strikes. You can replace one of those with a use of this feature without spending its key cost, meaning the key cost you use for Flurry of Blows is a freebie to use this. That's very similar to the Tranquility Monk. Or Hands of Harm. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, you can choose to spend one key point to deal extra necrotic damage equal to your martial arts die. Just the die, no wisdom modifier. However, if the creature is incapacitated or poisoned, the creature instead takes necrotic damage equal to three rolls of your martial arts die instead. You can use this feature only once on each of your turns. So that has a lot of potential to use with other abilities, especially your own innate... It doesn't... It says incapacitated or poisoned i believe stunned makes people incapacitated i could be wrong on that but i'm pretty sure it does so if you stun someone then they're incapacitated then you can deal extra damage with this feature and again it's when you hit with a strike so you don't waste it and it's part of an attack that you're already making so you could in theory in a turn attack twice flurry of blows and as long as you hit with an unarmed strike, deal up to three times your martial arts die damage on top of that, but only once per turn. Level six, you get the Noxious Aura ability. As a bonus action, you can spend a key point uh, on your turn to create an aura of toxic miasma. It extends five feet around you in every direction, uh, but not through total cover. It lasts for one minute until you're incapacitated or you dismiss it. While it's active, ranged attacks have disadvantage against you. Any other creature that starts its turn in the aura must succeed on a con save or become poisoned until the end of your next turn and take poison damage equal to your wisdom modifier. I feel like Spores Druids would really love this ability because this is way better than I feel like all the stuff that they got. So not only are monks hard to hit with ranged attacks because they can deflect missiles, they can catch missiles, this is only one key point for 10 turns in combat to give you dis, uh, range attacks at disadvantage against you. Mind you, range attacks are at disadvantage. If they somehow manage to hit you, you can still try to deflect missiles or throw a bat, or, you know, or catch it. Uh, but then if you're a monk, you're probably going to be up close punching people. Uh, and then if you're up close going to hit somebody, they have to make a con save. Um, it starts their turn in the aura, though, so keep that in mind. Or become poisoned. Um and take uh, this is a question here any other creature that starts its turn in the aura must succeed on a con save or become poison until the end of your next turn and take poison damage equal to your wisdom modifier i'm confused if it sounds like if they pass the saving throw they are not poisoned and they take no poison damage is i think how i'm reading that um so but you know it doesn't say that if they succeed they're immune to it so if you leave their area and come back into it again they could potentially get poisoned again taking more poison damage at 11 you get healing technique when you restore hit points to a creature using your hands of healing you can also end one disease or condition from the following list uh blinded deafened paralyzed or poisoned that's fantastic it's like a lesser kind of lay on hands similar to the tranquility monk so i like this and then lastly hand of mercy and this is a really interesting ability on multiple levels as an action, you touch a creature, expend four key points, and force them to make a con save. A creature can willingly fail this. Uh, unless the save succeeds, the creature enters a state of suspended animation for a number of days equal to your monk level or until you end it, at this point being a minimum of 17 days. During this time, the creature is paralyzed, has immunity to all damage, and any cursed disease or poison affecting it is suspended. The creature appears dead to all outward inspection and the spells used to determine the creature's status. You can only have one creature under this effect uh, of this feature. So what's cool about this is you could use this to basically be a bounty hunter, frozen in carbonite style scenario by hitting or touching somebody and then putting them in stasis for you to transport them safely without them being a threat to anyone. You could use this to save an ally who may be dying from a debilitating disease they choose to fail it and you can cart them to you and get them to a healer. Uh, and one of the important things, they put the rule tip here, you're a creature. You can touch yourself with this, willingly fail, and basically put yourself in a state of suspended animation. And what it says here um, is it lasts for a number of days equal to your monk level or until you end the effect early. So 
doesn't really state how aware you are of your surroundings, but in theory, you could put yourself into your own suspended animation to sustain a, a period of time to have that go by without people knowing you're there and people will think you're dead. But my only question is, do you know, are you aware enough of your surroundings to know when it's a good time to come out of it? Or are you just going to be like, I'm going to go into suspended animation for three days, then I'm going to wake up or 17 days and then I'm going to wake up and you don't know what's going to happen. That is not really answered by it, but it's something interesting to play around with. Next up, we have Paladin, the Oath of the Watchers. They seek to protect the mortal realm from predations of extra planar creatures. Uh, so they are basically soldiers defending against all sorts of weird outworldy stuff. What do you get as far as your oath spells? Alarm and Chromatic Orb. First time we've seen a Paladin with Chromatic Orb. Augury and Moonbeam. Counterspell, which is huge, because Paladins never get that. Non-detection. Aura of Purity, Banishment, Hold Monster, and Hallow. A decent mix of different spells, most of them not on the Paladin spell list. Your Channel Divinity at level 3, you get Watcher's Will. You can choose uh, use your Channel Divinity as an action. You choose a number of creatures you can see within 30 feet up to your Charisma modifier. For one minute, they get advantage on all Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma saving throws. So that's pretty cool. Or Abjure the Extra Planar. This is essentially Turn Undead, except it only works on Elemental, Fae, Fiends, or Aberrations. Uh, they need to make a Wisdom saving throw or be turned for one minute uh, or until they take damage. Aura of the Sentinel. I really like this ability. Uh, when It's your 7th level aura. When you or any creature of your choice within 10 feet rolls initiative, they get a bonus equal to your charisma modifier. That's pretty sweet. And then it'll increase out to a range of 30 feet at 18th level. Uh, I super love this ability too. Vigilant Rebuke. Whenever you or a creature you can see within 30 feet of you succeeds on a saving throw against a spell. Against a spell. Not your spell. Against any spell. You can use your reaction to deal 2d8 plus your charisma modifier in force damage to the spellcaster. That could be really cool. So whenever you are a creature you can see within 30 feet of you succeeds on a saving throw against a spell, use your reaction to deal charisma modifier, force damage to the spellcaster. So... This has a lot of potential, so let's say an enemy spellcaster casts a spell against one of your allies. Your ally potentially nearby you, getting the benefit of your aura of protection, getting your charisma modifier to saving throws, and your ally succeeds on their saving throw. Awesome, they don't take the damage, whatever it is. You then use your reaction to deal 2d8 plus your charisma modifier and force damage to that enemy spellcaster. That could potentially make them lose concentration because this is just straight damage, no saving throw for the enemy. They could possibly, this could cause them to drop their save, uh, their concentration on the spell and give the party a significant leg up. So there's a lot of good uses for this. Um, there's the potential where if you need for some reason to down an ally, that could be an option too. Like if an enemy succeeds on a saving throw, then you want to hit, your party for some damage i don't know why you'd want to do it but there's options there as well maybe someone's mind controlled and you use that to knock them out of the mind control that's an option too and then lastly we have mortal bulwark which is your level 20 ability your transformation here it's a bonus action for one minute you get true sight out to 120 feet you have advantage on all attack rolls against elementals fey fiends and aberrations and when you hit a creature with an attack and deal damage to it you can also force it to make a charisma saving throw on a failed save it is magically banished to its native plane of existence if it's not currently there. On a successful save, the creature can't be banished for 24 hours. So you basically get banishing smite all the time. Once you use this bonus action, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. Pretty solid overall. I'm um, not too nuts about all the domain or all the oath spells, but counterspell is nice to have. Uh, I really love this level 7 ability. This just boost to initiative is pretty solid. I like any kind of reaction-based utility you can get as a paladin uh, to allow you to use your reaction for something other than just opportunity attacks is nice. Uh, a turning feature that fits a large chunk of things is useful, but also just giving your allies advantage on mental-based saving throws, also big. And lastly, we have the Warlock Noble Genie. So this is your patron is a genie. Your expanded spell list is Fog Cloud, Sleep, Enlarge, Reduce, Phantasmal Force, 
Great food and water, protection from energy, polymorph, phantasmal killer, Bigby's hand, and creation. I think a lot of these are on the spell list for the warlock. I know Bigby's hand is not. Um, so that's cool. I don't know if phantasmal forces either. So you get your collector's vessel, right? Your genie uh, patron. So they're going to give you something, an urn, a lamp, you know, typical things. Um, you can do a whole ritual to get your vessel back if you lose it. But as an action, while you're holding the vessel, you can target a willing creature you can see within 100 feet and create a tether of wispy energy to them. The tether lasts for one hour until you use this feature on another creature, uh, until the bound target is reduced to zero hit points, or until they move more than 100 feet away from you. Uh, while they're tethered, you get the following benefits. You uh, gain a bonus to your Wisdom Perception check, equal to your Charisma modifier, which is nice. And whenever you cast a spell, you can deliver it from your space or your bound creature's space. So if you have an ally 100 feet away and they're right next to an enemy, you could deliver a touch spell through your ally. Or use that as the point to trigger, say, Eldritch Blast to extend it by another 120 feet. You can create a number of tethers equal to your Charisma modifier, and you regain all uses when you finish a long rest. Not sure how I feel about it being a long rest, uh, as you are a sort or sorry, you are a warlock, and all of your spells come back on a short rest. So getting abilities back on a short rest as a warlock seems to be a no brainer because most of like most of your things, like I, I think if I if I remember correctly, on a lot of the other warlocks, their abilities um, either are kind of always on or they function after a short or long rest. I could be wrong, but uh, this is kind of like your whole big thing at the start, and a lot of your later abilities key off of this, and being, you know, Charisma Modifier per Long Rest is nice, because it does give you potentially up to five uses, so you can manage that accordingly. I'm not sure if it's, I think with the later updates, it becomes too much per Short Rest, but let's go ahead and keep going. Elemental Resistance. Your patron grants you protection from an element. Whenever you finish a long rest, you gain resistance to acid, cold, fire, or lightning damage. Your choice until the end of your next long rest. While you have a tether, they also gain resistance to that damage type, which is nice. But I think, like, the um, the Fiend Pack Warlock gets to change their... Uh, I want to say they get to change their resistance after a short or long rest. Um, so that kind of seems silly although the benefit of this is you do get to um you do get to extend it to an ally which you don't get to do as a fiend pack warlock just bear with me one sec while i just look this up real quick just to see uh the fiend here we go fiendish resilience uh you gain resist so that was a resistance to a damage type period any damage type when you finish a short or long rest um, and then you get to choose whenever you do the next one. That did come at level 10. This comes at level 6 and is extendable to an ally. So that may be the, tr the trade-off, but I'll let you guys decide what you think. At 10, you get Protective Wish. You're now able to use your Collector's Vessel to wish for protection. If you are a tethered creature is hit by an attack, you can use your reaction to teleport, swapping places with the creature and switching which one of you is hit by the attack. So this is good. It doesn't uh, it doesn't state anything here that that damage can't be reduced at all. So potentially if they're going to get hit with like a fire sword and you have resistance to fire and they don't, you could swap your positions so that you get the resistance and take half damage or the barbarian who's raging or however the case may be. So this has a lot of good strategic use, assuming that the tether is on someone that would that will be useful for. You also get two abilities at level 10. The other one is Genie's Entertainment. As an action, you attempt to send a creature you can see within 90 feet of you to your patron's court. The target must succeed on a charisma saving throw against your warlock spell save DC or be magically drawn into your vessel, your lamp or whatever it is, and teleported to your patron's court in the elemental planes. While there, the target is stunned and your patron marvels at the target with amusement but brings no harm to it. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turn, reappearing in a space it left or the nearest unoccupied space if that space is currently occupied. Once you use this feature, you can use it. You can't use it again until you finish a long rest. If the target remains in your patron's court for one whole minute, the length of the the duration of uh, this, I think it is. Oh no, it doesn't say. If it remains for one minute, the genie sends the target back at the end of its turn as if it successfully saved, and you regain the use of this feature. So that's I think the first time we've seen an ability like that. You send somebody away for 
potentially an indeterminate amount of time, but if it hits a minute, 10 rounds of combat, then they return as though they had succeeded and you get the ability back immediately, which is pretty interesting. And lastly, at 14, we get uh, Collector's Call. In exchange for extending your patron's influence over the multiverse, you can call on more power. As an action, you implore your patron for aid by making a persuasion check against your warlock spell save DC. If you succeed, you gain one of the following. A creature you can see within 60 feet of you regains 8d6 hit points and ends one disease or condition afflicting it, blinded, charmed, deafened, frightened, paralyzed, or poisoned. A creature you can see within 60 feet of you has disadvantage on attack rolls and saving throws until the start of your next turn. Or you cast the legend lore spell without any material components. Whether the check succeeds or fails, you can't use this feature again until you finish a long rest. Alternatively, you can regain the, fe the use of this feature by sacrificing non-magical treasure worth at least 500 gold to your patron. The sacrifice requires the treasure to be within 10 feet of you for at least a minute, at the end of which you can use an action to teleport the treasure to your patron's realm, provided you have the vessel of your collector's vessel in hand. So this is, again, another use we've never seen. You get to use the ability back as long as you have non-magical treasure to sacrifice to your patron. Uh, it just takes one minute and then you get the ability back as long as you can do so. This is pretty interesting because outside of the Celestial Warlock, this is one of the only ways a Warlock can heal an ally in that you get them 8d6 hit points and get to cure a disease. Or uh, And it's also interesting that you're making a Persuasion check against your own spell save DC. So that's kind of funky. And if you somehow have a means of getting yourself um, expertise on Persuasion, whether it be through multi-class or a feat, you could just hedge your bets significantly in the other direction, right? If you manage to get, say you take a one level dip in Rogue to get expertise in Persuasion, you're gonna add double your proficiency bonus for Persuasion checks to potentially stack that in your favor so you can always make use of Collector's Call in a positive fashion. I just like the idea of you competing against one of your stats, competing against a different one of your stats to represent your patron i thought that, that was pretty unique so that's it folks that is the brand new subclasses part one also note from the the title it is subclasses part one therefore at least a part two is coming if not part three four and however many so for those of you who have been upset about the explorer's guide to wild mount coming out and not being your xanathar's guide part two book fear not we may still be it looks like we're still getting it we had all of our subclasses that were released um, in UA towards the end of the year, none of which are going to be contained in the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, so it's not going to be any of those. And these, which I'm actually shocked, are not reprints or revisions of the previous ones. This is entirely new, um, entirely new subclasses. So as far as ones that I like the most, I think I'm a big fan of the Monk. Uh, and the Barbarian the most over everything, although I do really like aspects of the Paladin. The Warlock I could take or leave, I'm not too crazy about it. The Paladin, I like definite abilities about it, I like the Retributive damage, and I like the Charisma modifier um, to initiative as part of the aura, and that may be something that I may just adopt in games as like a magic weapon, or magic item for someone, that gives you, that for a Paladin to boost that ability. But I'm curious to see what you guys think. Were you expecting this? We had all the crazy announcements. Usually Unearthed Arcana comes out on a Monday, but we got Critical Role announcement yesterday, and then not even stopping the hype train at all, Wizard says, guess what? Unearthed Arcana 2020 Part 1, here we go. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments below, and I'll see you next time.